people have mysteriously vanished in America's wilderness. Join us as we dive into the deep end of the unexplainable and try to piece together what happened. You are listening to Locations Unknown. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Locations Unknown. I'm your co-host, Joe Irado, and with me, as always, is a guy who would never slap Chris Rock, Mike <laughs> Van Bogart. Uh, thanks, Joe, and thank you once again to all of our loyal listeners for tuning in. Just a couple of uh, announcements before we get started. Uh, I'd like to give some shout-outs to uh, new Patreon supporters. So we've got uh, Jennifer Roy. Meredith Burroughs, Eric Woods, Jessica Parks, Catherine Sikowski, uh, Camilla uh, Hano, and Lindsay Cagle. So uh, thank you so much for supporting the show. Uh, every, every dollar you guys uh, throw at us helps us produce a better show, and we've said this a bunch of times. We're looking for some studio space at some point this year. And, uh, uh, yeah, so just uh, – and if you can't support the show monetarily, you know, head over to, like, iTunes – uh, Spotify, subscribe and leave us a five star uh, rating because that yeah. helps. Ratings really help a lot. Yeah, no one stars, just five stars. <laughs> yeah, one stars. Call the number. Call the number instead of leaving a one star, and we'll put the voicemail on the show. Yes. A uh, couple other quick announcements. We've we've got some new swag here, so we actually have some of it um, with us. So we've got uh, playing cards for those who are watching the live stream. Um, we've got marble. <laughs> Marble magnets. Joe, hold that up to the camera. Zoom in. Zoom in. in. Um, we've got Those are uh, nice. drink coasters. Very high quality. Oh, yeah. More than one use. And, uh, another, and a, another, another magnet. Another style of magnet. If you'd like the, <laughs> the standard style, you don't want to go as fancy, perfectly. Fine. Um, so you can find all of... And we've always had our mugs. Always have mugs. Always had the mug. Always be closing. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> So you can find all that stuff on our Facebook store and eventually on our website store. So if you want to help the show out and get some some cool stuff, you can go to one of our stores and buy some of the stuff. Um, other than that, I have no other updates, Joe. What about you? Nope. Just glad to be back from vacation and making more episodes. <laughs> so it's all Life good. Life is hard. I know, right? It's so <laughs> hard. All right, everybody. Let's gear up and get out to explore locations unknown. July 4th, 2012, a 65-year-old Alaska native and adventurer sets off on a grueling marathon race in Seward, Alaska. Many observers, racers, and judges interacted with him during the race and even right before his disappearance. Join us this week as we investigate the bizarre case of Michael LeMater. Mike, we're back in Alaska, <laughs> and not because of the triangle. No, um, I love Alaska. I was there uh, end of fall of 2020, um, and I've actually been to the location that we're going to talk about today. What happened when you were in Alaska? Uh, I also got engaged. hey <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I've never been. I'm looking forward to going, and I was very nervous about saying the name of this town uh, yes. in the intros because I wanted to say Seward, and it's Seward. Seward. Seward, according to Google Translate. And according, Seward. And according to me. <laughs> yeah, and according to <laughs> anyone who's been there and knows the real name. Uh, so we're going to Mount Marathon in Seward, Alaska, and it's named after a race, which Mike is going to go over in a little bit. It's really cool. Uh, the peak is located in the 
Chugach National Forest. I, I don't think I said that one right. We're I, th- go, we're I think it's the Chugach. Chugach? Did I yeah. say that? Yeah. Chugach. Chugach. Yeah, there you go. You're two for I was, two. I was close. Chugach, Chugach. <laughs> Keeping score. Uh, it was established roughly 1915, so it's an older park, and it sees about half a million visitors a year. Well, the uh, mountain was, um, sorry, the mountain the was, mountain was established. Uh, named around 1915. Okay, so it wasn't a national forest until later? or uh, Yeah, you know, I, I forgot to write that down. That's okay. <laughs> I'll forgive you this time. Okay. It sees about a half a million visitors a year. Uh, by comparison, Zion National Park in Utah gets more than 5 million, so this is not a heavily accessed area. Uh, it's remote as it is. I mean, yeah. how many people go to Alaska, let alone to specific parks that aren't I mean, the main how many ones? live in Alaska? Probably <laughs> 500,000. Yeah, this is everyone visits once. Yes. <laughs> so the Chugach National Forest is the farthest north and west of all the national forests and is 30% covered in ice, if you can imagine why. The Chugach is the size of the state of New Hampshire, yet only has 90 miles of Forest Service roads. So it's really, really remote. Very in areas. Remote. Uh, all five North American species of Pacific salmon are found in the Chugach. The king, red, silver, chum, and pink. I didn't know there were that many different I had no idea. types of salmon. Yes. It's, it's, I learned something Apparently new now. there are. <laughs> yeah. uh, in a distance of just 10 miles, the forest rises from sea level up to 13,100 feet at Mount Marcus Baker. That's really cool. I really like um, hiking and climbing areas where they have that aggressive mountain yeah. climb. So it doesn't, you know, there's some places you go to, they're like, oh, you're 12,000 feet. And you're like. Okay. Like, yeah. We drove here, basically. <laughs> Those always look so beautiful, too. They look so enormous. Yeah. Uh, Alaska's home to 17 of North America's tallest mountains. Of t- the 20 highest peaks in the USA, 17 are Alaska, including the highest peak in North America, which is Denali, at 20,320 feet above sea level. Anyone who's been to Alaska and been <clears throat> kind of in the center of the state, Denali kind of like, I mean, it looks like a like a spaceship in the distance. It's so huge. Oh, you can just kind of see it from everywhere? You can see it from everywhere for miles and miles and miles because there's not really any other mountains around it. It just, like, rises out of the ground. That's wild. Yes. Was it a volcano or is it, like... Is it, uh, that I don't know. Is it magma pushing it up, <laughs> like, from underneath? Probably. I don't know. I don't, I don't know, know at all. <clears throat> all right. Uh, Alaska has more than 100 volcanoes and volcanic fields. Alaska contains more volcanoes and volcanic fields than any other state in the U.S., Alaska is approximately 50 miles from Russia, so no, you cannot see it from your house, but if the ocean wasn't there, you could drive to it in under an hour. Uh, the majority of Alaskans are men with about 52%. So don't uh, do, uh, you know, any uh, bachelor parties there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the highest percentage of any state because we're dumb enough to want to go there and live there. Uh, the only battle during World War II that was fought on American soil did take place in Alaska in 1943. Uh, they invaded the Aleutian Islands, and that was called the Battle of Atu, which lasted from May 11th to May 30th. God bless you. What? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you are so a dad. You've turned into a dad. That is That was so good. <laughs> I am a sneeze. This is Atu. <laughs> I love that movie. Uh, Alaska has the lowest temperature recorded in the U.S., which was recorded at negative 80 degrees at Prospect Creek Camp in 1971. And I'm guessing that is negative 80, not wind chill. Yeah, that's negative 80 degrees Fahrenheit. <sighs> oh, my gosh. I don't ever want to be there. No. Um, in addition to having all of the salmon species, the largest salmon ever caught was caught in the Kenai River. Weighing it at 97 pounds, four ounces. That's a huge salmon. <laughs> so big. And this, this I knew, and it's terrifying. Yeah. Kodiak bears can weigh up to 1,500 pounds, and they can be 10 feet tall standing on their hind legs. So to put it in perspective, if a Kodiak bear came up to a standard two-story home yeah. in, the, in America, it could stand on its hind legs and look in the second-story window yeah. without stretching. Alaska. That the, is ridiculous. Alaska is the only place where the a grizzly bear is not the the most like terrifying animal that could kill you. <laughs> God, the, I know. Don't they have a, a Kodiak in the airport? I don't know. They have a full, I, don't I think they. I think there's one in their airport, and it has a story of why they killed it. But there's like a picture of the lady holding holding the paw, and it's the size of her upper body. <laughs> it's like insane. Yeah, they're massive. Yes. Uh, the temperature based on the Copen climate classification classification system for Mount Marathon. It is located in subarctic climate zone with long, cold, snowy winters and mild summers. 
I bet most people could have guessed that. Uh, <laughs> temperatures can drop below 20 degrees Celsius with a wind chill factor below 30. Um, the only thing this thing supports is spruce and hemlock trees. Everything else dies. <laughs> yep. Uh, for the months of May to June, uh, offer the most favorable weather for viewing. Is that when they do this race, too? Uh, July 4th. July. Okay. Yep. So right after. Uh, the Chubach Forest area is considered a temperate rainforest in the Pacific and temperate rainforest region. That was surprising just because it's so far north. But Yeah. It gets in. What, the, there the must thing be is, a thing. How much water does it have to get to be considered well, rainforest? Uh, like Anchorage, a lot of times because it's so close to the ocean, is warmer uh, in the winter than it is here in Milwaukee. Um, okay. Just because of its proximity to the ocean, so that's probably all right. There's just tons of moisture coming off the ocean, and, and it's just warmer right near the coast. Yeah, <clears throat> okay, that makes sense. Um, let's see here: the terrain, uh, four thousand eight hundred twenty-six foot mountain directly west of Seward, Alaska, in the Kenai Mountains. Uh, the peak is situated in the Chug- Chugach National Forest and rises above Resurrection Bay. So here are the types of animals that you would see in this area. Uh, there's two hundred different colonies of seabirds. Uh, between 3,000 and 5,000 bald eagles uh, at the Copper River. Oh, di- oh, oh one, one fun fact about the bald eagles. Um, the, oh, I skipped right over that. Yeah, so they have the same number of bald, ego, bald eagles in this national forest as the entire low, lower 48 of the U.S. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, <laughs> And we're starting to see them pretty prevalently, so they got to be like I like see them crows. in the city here. Yeah, I know. they yeah. got to be like crows just flying around everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, the Copper River Delta portion of the forest provides a habitat for over 20 million birds annually. Annually, <laughs> um, I said annually. Uh, <laughs> coyote, uh, timber wolves, moose, caribou. I don't know what a martin is. A martin? Uh, like Martin, the show. <laughs> <laughs> He's just hanging out there. They have one. <laughs> um, mountain goats, black bears, grizzly bears, doll sheep, and humpback whale, sea lions, and otters. No, they're not in the forest. They can be found in the waters in the area. We're not going to go into the difference between black bears and grizzly bears on this show. We've nope. done it plenty of times in the past. Nope. And we're not <laughs> experts if we haven't made that abundantly clear. Yes. All right. So a uh, good stretch of the trail that we're talking about is steep with some se- uh, some sections requiring hikers to use both hands and their feet to get up uh, and their butts to get down. So, so you're talking like steep scree hills where you're yeah. sliding around and stuff. And to get down, you got to like really like kind of just like inch down on your butt okay to keep from falling or you'll start sliding and run around yeah um some sections of the trail have been worn smooth from all the runners and then can become very slippery a hiking pole is recommended especially probably when it's raining uh exposure so the weather changes quickly you're in the mountains you're in north alaska uh you're in alaska i'm not sure exactly where and the fluctuations in body temperature as you climb will demand different layers so it could be a little bit warmer at the parking lot once you get up in altitude it can be very 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 cold and weather in the mountains changes very quickly yeah we've talked about this a lot and um you know it in alaska there's not very a, a lot of margin for air with uh you know it could get if it gets bad in alaska it's gonna get really cold yeah and absolutely so the all trails rating for this trail that uh our our disappearing victim was uh, rated hard. I'm trying to see where it says it. Oh, it says right here. For those listening, we're streaming. Yep. Um, I'm showing it on the on the screen. So it's rated hard. And I was reading through some of the comments here, and uh, my favorite one was amazing, but need more truth tellers about the climb once you reach the loose shale rocks vertical. <laughs> no real path, and you have to crawl and risk slipping on loose rocks. Mixed with wind uh, was not safe to go fully go up. Other than that, it was great but dangerous once you reach a certain point. So a lot of people are saying how amazing it was. They weren't necessarily saying, uh, you know, we you wouldn't be able to make this trip or anything like that. But I think this this uh, commenter felt they were underplaying the danger. Yeah, and I think everything that I read, and we're actually gonna we're gonna watch a, a couple short videos. Um, this guy who trail runs this trail every year. Um, I think if you're actually doing the marathon up the mountain, you definitely can't be a novice. Um, I think if you're just to like leisurely hike it. I'm sure you and I have done some hikes that have been just as dangerous as this or, or more dangerous. Sure. Uh, so. <laughs> just a few. Um, but yeah, so there's, are we at the point where you talk about the race? Um, yeah, I think, uh, history. Yes. So, history of the race. <laughs> yes. So, uh, we're going to kind of the next couple segments here, we're going to go into the history of the marathon race, uh, Mount marathon race. And then, 
Um, we're going to, instead of you listening to us just describe the trail, we're going to have a professional uh, who already did that for us describe it and show us the trail. So uh, uh, kind of cool. And then we'll, we'll do some commenting on it in between the videos. Um, the history of this Mount Marathon race is really funny. It sounds like it started in a bar with two drunk guys like, oh, I bet you can't get to the top of that mountain. <laughs> And the other guy's like, I bet you I can. And, and uh, I mean, so pretty much that is how it started. The race started with a bar bet um, who could run up the big peak behind town and back in under an hour. So um, <laughs> That's so awesome. There was no, you know, cell phones, computers, or anything back then. So this is how you entertained yourself. Well, think about, <laughs> think about the type of dudes that are living in Alaska in the early 1900s. Yeah. They're tough guys, so you ain't going to tell them they can't do anything. <laughs> yeah, so uh, uh, on Independence Day of 1909, Seward was a six-year-old pioneer village full of miners and other, like Joe said, hard men. Uh, Al Taylor, a dog musher and one of those strong fathers of Alaska, reportedly took the wager. Uh, dressed in wool pants, leather boots, and his Sunday best white shirt, Taylor pounded up the dirt uh, streets and into the woods. He reappeared just over an hour later and bought a round uh, for the house, according to uh, Millie uh, Spaisley's history of the race. Uh, 1915, the race up Mount Marathon, uh, the peak was soon named for this run. So, And it, it, it became an annual thing <clears throat> every July 4th. <clears throat> Since then, um, there's been only two reasons why the race hasn't happened so uh world war and great depression so every other year it's happened and i actually should have looked it up but i don't know if they did it for covid so um oh yeah i'll, may, I'll, I'll look into it while you're maybe gone. three events but uh so for decades this race um wasn't very popular fewer than 10 runners would complete it yearly and it was pretty much a free-for-all any way up or down was fair game so um Men sprinted down alleys, they uh, climbed over cars, sabotaged each other's shortcuts. Uh, the night before, fences would spring up in people's yards to prevent people from completing the race. Um, and back then, winners would win a really nice purse. And I don't mean like a handbag, I mean a, a money. It was canceled during COVID. Okay. Third time. Third time. So We were alive for the third time. Yeah, there you I go. That's a good thing. Um, it's always tragedy, so it's not a good thing. <laughs> yeah. So uh, in 1950, the prize was $2,500. So uh, I don't know what that is in inflation terms, but that, that's a lot of money for winning a, a 3.1-mile race. Yeah. Um, so now, instead of a cash prize, winners get a trophy and a free entry into the future race. So um, the race really didn't get popular until the running boom of the 1970s. So um, I obviously, Joe and I, weren't around there for that, but, um, <laughs> uh, the running boom of the 1970s. Yeah. So, uh, it got really popular. So they actually had to cap the, uh, sorry about that. Oh, we're having some, uh, sorry. I think we're having a little, nah, that was a, a volume adjustment and it windows likes to let you know that you've adjusted the volume. Yeah. And I think my camera feed keeps turning off Okay, or is that, I don't know. Um, oh, so we're good. Uh, the race, like I said, the popularity of the race swelled in the 1970s, and as of today, they cap the race at 1,000 men, 1,000 women, uh, and children as young as seven. Um, and it says, people of all stripes show out from housewives to elite athletes. Entry is $85 for an adult and 35 for a kid. Uh, about 90% of the adults are returning runners, and until a recent rule change, all finishers gained entry into the next year's race. Uh, so to get into this race, there's a lottery and it's a very coveted and the, a lot of people say the only in Alaska say the only thing harder than running a uh, Mount marathon is uh, getting a chance to run it. So it's very, oh, wow. yeah. I'm like thousands of people, 10, 20, 30,000 people descend on Seward at July 4th to just like be at the finish line for this. So it's a huge event in Alaska. So it's probably equivalent to Wisconsinites trying to get season tickets for the Packers. I mean, probably, yeah. And <laughs> so anyone in Wisconsin listening, yeah, it's that difficult, probably. So now we are going to show uh, four short videos. Uh, we apologize for the people that are listening. You, you'll, you'll hear, hear them. It. You'll but, hear it. Um, this is a gentleman who uh, trail runs this tra this race every year, and he's a pro at it, and he's going to kind of go into. 
um, the the course and the difficulties of it, and we'll we'll comment on each uh, each video when they're done. All right. Your hands are on your knees, kind of pushing, speed hiking. It's great I music. Yeah. Find that this <laughs> is one of the more difficult parts of the mountain. It's steep and it can be slippery. If somebody slips, if it's a wet day, and if somebody slips, they'll literally just take people out as they go sliding down this <laughs> muddy ramp right here. <laughs> well, from right here, what makes this special is we just came out of the trees. It's not slippery anymore, there's no more mud. We're gonna be on gravel and rock and scree. And when you've come out of there, this feels great. Just having a little bit of cool air on you. The story of this upper mountain is that it's incredibly braided. There are numerous ways of going, and there's no rule. You can take any route that you like. This is where experience can give someone an advantage. You get a, you get a great boost here. There's always people on top, they're cheering for you, and you know that you've done the hardest part. But you also have to keep in mind, now you're doing the most dangerous part next. The screen. <laughs> so the one thing I got away from that, got from that video is it's not a very long hike up to the top. Oops. Sorry. Um, so uh, it, it looks incredibly demanding if you're running it. Yeah, I like the way, I like his method of like using his hands to move his knees. <laughs> yeah. I've like, totally done that before when I'm going uphill and everything's yeah. heavy. I'm like pushing like well, pistons. Well, in this <clears throat> one thing that kind of bugged me when I watch this too is whenever we're hiking, I always like be prepared if I'm out in the woods like overnight. And this guy had a t-shirt and shorts on in running yeah. shoes. Let's, so. let's assume his cameraman had all the gear. Yes, we'll just or the that. Sherpas that are out of view. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So this I, is part two about the scree fields. I hate the scree fields. When he said, oh, we're in the scree, it's a good thing. I was like, oh, man, that might just be terrible. Yeah, right? <laughs> we call it a controlled fall, and that's exactly what it is. Very easy to, to, to take a trip, and this rock is sharp. If you take a fall up here, uh, you're going to know it. Trust me. He's so fast. This December. <laughs> Scree Down field. in this section, it's very much more forgiving. It's much softer, and you can run it very fast. Uh, the all-time best is six minutes from the top of the mountain oh, that's to insane. the street, and it's over a mile. In a world where everyone's running up, <laughs> be the one who slides down <laughs> this summer. Scree field. <laughs> That's what I feel like I'm watching. It's yeah. like an intense movie. This is wild, though. This guy is fast. Yeah, he's good. Way to go down that stuff in Africa, and our guides are yelling, pole, 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 pole. I mean, slow, slow, slow. Oh, really? I kept trying to do this. the bottom of the tree field, and we're entering what's called the gut. <laughs> the nature of the mountain and the footing changes dramatically right here. So intense. So, oh, my gosh. I've, I love it. I've gone down scree like that, and I go so slow because I'm afraid of slipping and just tumbling down. Yeah. Like That guy was flying down at light speed. So I was. I don't know if I was going that fast because I don't remember, but when I was coming <laughs> off of Kilimanjaro because I was so out of it, there were scree fields like that, and I was just so done. Yeah. We'd been hiking since like 10 the night before, and it was like noon the next day, and we'd been up the whole time climbing. Yeah. And I just wanted to go back to camp and go to sleep. <laughs> And I was, I felt like I was just like, like jumping down yeah. and like running. And then they're yelling, pole, 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 pole. So I wouldn't <laughs> fall. And um, my buddy who I was with said, I would just stop when they would yell. I'd sit down on a rock and I would fall asleep immediately. Yeah. And they would catch up to me and then they would essentially like wake me up and I'd start going again. Yeah. All right. So let's watch this one. The, this is the, the gut. The gut. <clears throat> We've just come off the bottom of the screen field and we're entering what's called the gut. You can see this jagged rock, these boulders, and we're about to hit the first of what's called the problems. And there's three <laughs> problems. <laughs> this is problem number one. It's I got three problems in my gut. Problem. <laughs> to the safety minded, the message is to 
is to try to take your time through here and not get hurt. This is actually where most of the injuries take place. And the reason is by now your legs are just exhausted. Their eyes are just glazed over. I love how I just got to stop looking there. Like at this point of the race, they're just like, this sucks so much. Like that's a problem. Yeah. What should we call it? Added problem. Problem one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the first problem. Ah, oh, there's another problem. <laughs> All you're doing is focusing on what's in front of you. This is where you're going to turn either left to go down the cliff face, which is where the vast majority of the races <laughs> it's a will go. picture of a guy falling or off a cliff. Down here at the other snow fencing, you're going to turn right to take the safety trail down, uh, also known as the switchback trail. Which one's you faster? You do not want to go straight where this is going to take you to the waterfall, which unless you are an expert, you do not want to go down that way. It's restarting. Hold on. Sorry, yeah. we had another technical issue. Yeah. All right. So this one is the final? Uh, yes. All right. Every 4th oh, of July, no. athletes from around the country converge oh, the on the town video. of Seward. Oh, what is this one? Um, oh, that's a full. Yeah, we don't want to do That's an hour long. We're not yeah, doing that no. long. That was the last one in the sheet. Um, okay, that was all of them. <laughs> sure. That looks wild. Yeah, so there was one more. We don't have to play it. Okay. Um, so that's a little bit of a description of um, the the race itself, and it looks, it, looks, it looks really cool to hike, but it would be – I don't know that I would ever do that. <laughs> I don't think I'd part. do that. No, I, I don't like running on the flat ground. Yeah, let alone, so let alone down a mountain. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to jump into a uh, character profile here. So, um, like we said, the guy's name was Michael Paul Lem- Lemaitre. How'd you say it, Joe? Lemaitre. Lemaitre. Sorry. Like you- tell Mater <laughs> from cars. Oh, your, your kid's not old enough yet. You guys are no. watching Disney movie soon. Um, and just quickly, when I muted you, did that cut our feet off to the roadcaster? No. Oh, that was just audio from the computer, and I don't even know if it for sure did. So we'll fight. We'll, we'll fight. Okay, out. we'll cut that. Cut that. Cut that. Yep. Uh, <laughs> so he was born in uh, September second, nineteen forty six. He went missing July fourth, twenty twelve. He was a male, age sixty five. He was six foot two, two hundred and twelve pounds. He had blue eyes. Uh, gear he was last seen in black shorts and a black shirt and running shoes. So he had no gear with him, no water, no food. Because uh, he was running a marathon, yep. he wasn't planning <clears throat> to go hiking. So, and did it say how many people are doing this marathon? Uh, they cap it, at, so they do it in sections. So okay. uh, the women run it first earlier in the day, and then at three p.m. the men run. Okay, uh, so it's a thousand. Uh, okay, and, so there's a lot. There's a ton of people there. Yeah, and we'll get into uh, his pace in the race. Um, but okay, so th- this actually leads right into the next issue about him so he wasn't carrying any water because there are checkpoints up the mountain that have water um but he was unaware that due to his slow pace the people at the checkpoints were packing up so he was hitting these checkpoints oh he was so behind the pack they thought everybody yep. had gone by yeah so Ooh. uh he was you know running a little slower than uh you know these people at the checkpoints thought so they were packing up so there'd be no water for him uh personality uh, based on you know family and friends, he was a very adventurous uh, man. He his daughter said, "My dad had he had always had an adventurous spirit. He did the I'm going to butcher this, uh, Joe. Do you want to try this out on our pronunciation under personality? The I did a ski. Here, hi, hi, uh, highlight it for me. Um, <laughs> right? Yeah, there. we we totally. Uh, let's see here. Let's see if I can guess it. How did the I did. I did a ski. I did a ski. Yeah, that's what you said. <clears throat> Let's see here. Iditaski. Well, Iditaski. It's Greek. Iditaski. 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 So he did the Iditaski several times. Uh, he had a lot of exciting adventures on the water. He was definitely a physically fit, uh, but he hadn't been on a mountain, on this mountain before. So very adventurous guy. And we're going to get into a couple stories of things he did in his younger days. Uh, seemed like a pretty falling, uh, pretty funny guy. Uh, medical issues, 
it was mentioned that his eyesight was kind of starting to fail a little bit, but it was good enough for him to finish the race. Uh, but overall, he was in very good shape for his age, routinely weightlifted, and he ran at his local gym uh, routinely. And he'd also finished a 12K a month earlier. So um, pretty fit guy for 65 and definitely not the the oldest guy running this race. Pictures I saw, there there had to have been guys in their 80s running. Yeah, he, uh, he's got that smile where you know he's just a goofball. Like He's yeah. a lot of fun to be around. Yeah, he looked like a fun guy. But not like troublemaker fun, like just like a fun, like a, like a kind soul type of fun guy. Yeah, no, he seemed like a really nice guy. Um, Michael was originally from New York. He moved to Alaska to attend the University of Alaska Fairbanks. He had a PhD in business administration, dozens of training certificates, and was an accredited grief counselor. Now, this is really cool. Uh, he volunteered at a ho- for a hospice program for children orphaned by the 9-11 attacks. Oh, wow. So um, so not only did he seem like a fun guy, but he was a real, you know, give back to the community type of guy. And um, for the 18 years prior to his disappearance, he worked at a local Air Force base, mainly writing resumes for colonels and, and privates as they transitioned out of the service. Oh, uh, yeah. So he's just a really good guy. He's just a really like, nice just, guy. I'm going to help anybody yep. that I can. Um, so he loved to camp, hike, fish around Alaska. Uh, a couple funny stories of, about him in the eighties uh, when he wanted to learn cross country skiing, he didn't take lessons, but signed up for the, I did a ski. Now the Iditarod trail invitational, a 210 mile wilderness race, uh, in which entrants drag their own supplies on sledges. So he, to learn to ski, he signed up for the, I like the ride. longest ski race that you can <laughs> yeah. do. Yeah. And he, uh, he twice he won the Red Lantern Award that's given to the last place finisher. <laughs> so kind of funny. I'm sure he would laugh about it. You know what it too. is? This is like something I'm going to end up being. Like yeah. I'm going to be 65 and I'm just going to sign up for inappropriate things for my abilities <laughs> and always finish last. But and just then be just like, disappear. Well, no, not, not that part. <laughs> but like just to be a part of some fun stuff, I would yeah. totally do that. Be like, I'm, I'm doing the idea around. Why to win? No. <laughs> I'm not going to win it. Are you kidding me? I'm 65. Like, no, I'm just going to attempt to do it and see if I could finish. Yeah, and actually the second time he finished last, he actually stopped to help a fellow skier. So, again, going Boom. back to he the... Could, he could have not been last. Yeah, so another funny story about Michael. Uh, him and his best friend, Rich Ansley, installed an overpowering motor onto Michael's dory in Anchorage and sailed towards Homer, Alaska, more than 120 nautical miles away. <laughs> The boat's fiberglass bottom literally began peeling apart in the middle of the, the uh, Kenai Narrows. They siphoned water out of the leaking boat, stopped to make some temporary repairs, and puttered uh, onto Homer. The next morning, they took the boat fishing in uh, Kanchemek Bay. So, uh, <laughs> it sounds like a really funny guy. Uh, oh, man. Yeah. Like, who does those things? Michael Lamet. Le, I can't say his Le, name again. Lemater. Lemater, like tater tot. Yeah, t- it's, that's what I said. If you saw the movie Cars, Tow Mater. Tow Mater. He's a tow truck. Joe's that's looking up this cam check or whatever it is. Yeah, let's see. Catchamac. 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 Catchamac Bay. Okay. Go. So, experience in this location, uh, Michael had never hiked or ran this course before, and carried uh, on with the race against the advice of his wife and youngest child. Uh, he actually even received a rookie letter after winning the race lottery that said, do not make the 4th of July race your first trip up Mount Marathon. So one of the themes about the race is they they really, really warn novices. Like, if you've never run this race before, you need to do it on your own first, like a slower pace. This can't be your first time to do it. Um, but, you know, based on his past experience of doing, like, wacky things, you know, like, I probably wouldn't do the Iditarod if I've never, like, had sled dogs before, but, you know, he did that, so. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we are going to jump right into the timeline here. So it's July 4th, 2012, 3 p.m. This is when the men's race starts. Uh, Michael sets off on a, a grueling marathon in Seward, Alaska. The race typically starts on 4th Avenue and Adams Street. It takes runners up. Marathon, uh, Marathon Mountain to the Summit Rock, which is about 3,000 feet above sea level. It's followed by a fast and dangerous descent down, uh, back down to Seward. 
Once racers reach the top, the fastest runners can make it back in under 10 minutes. Just like that gentleman in the video said, I yeah. think the record was uh, six minutes. Yeah, six minutes. Which is insane. The annual race is about 3.1 miles, has an average slope of 34 degrees, <clears throat> with 60 degrees at its steepest. So That's insane. That's, that's super steep. That's, that's, that's crawling. You can't walk up that. Yeah, and that's why they say that a lot of some of the spots you have to use your hands and kind of like, baby crawl up the mountain yeah um like we said the race was first organized in 1915 and it's regarded as one of the hardest short distance mountain races in the world uh the event here we go the event draws uh, more than 30,000 people to seward every year um joe's looking up google earth of it right now i'm showing it up on the screen so you guys can kind of see this is the side of the mountain right here oh my gosh yeah yeah it just just goes like a ledge just straight up. Yeah. It's uh that is aggressive. Is that the mountain? Yeah. Interesting. There's so there's race point right there. Okay, yeah. That's covered in snow. Yeah, let me zoom out a little bit. Yeah, race so this is where they go around that rock. Yep. In the video they go up around the rock and come back down. And that's not the actual peak of the mountain. Oh no. The peak is a little further up. Yeah, here's the peak way yeah. up here. Yeah, they they would have too much loss of life if they went up there. You have to go <laughs> yeah. that whole ridge, and I'm sure it's covered in snow almost all year round. Yeah. So, like we said, this was the first time that Michael had run this race. Uh, so he was not experienced in the area. And, of course, the day of the race, the weather was rainy and foggy, and it also rained the night before. And due to this, the trail conditions at the time were very slick and muddy, which uh, if you're talking – 30 to 60 degree angles, uh, not, you don't want that stuff to be slick. (laughs) So, um, tough conditions, especially for a novice who had never done this race before. So it is now July 4th, 2012 at 6 PM, about three hours into the race. Uh, Michael was slowly making his way up the mountain in last place as checkpoint officials were packing up. Michael was last seen by an official named Tom Walsh heading down the mountain just below uh, the race's turn around the point at elevation of about 3,000 feet. So Michael was only about 200 feet from the top when he was seen last. Um, So he was close. He was almost there. And he actually had asked the official if he could continue the race as there was plenty of daylight left, and he had already navigated the most dangerous parts of the course. And Race Point was obviously visible just up the trail. And he could still see all of Seward um, below him. So, Yeah, like it's, it, although dangerous, it'd be hard to get lost on the side of the mountain. I'll yeah. Go back up on Google Earth because, I mean, you're going to be a direct view right down to the city. Like up yeah. from here, like you can just see that. There's no trees in the way unless you're way down low. Yeah, you would know if you're off course. If you didn't see Seward, you're not going the right way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> so, like we said, he asked that official if he could um, continue. And Walsh, the official that was heading down, told him to loop uh, the rock, a top race point, and go down via the descent trail. According to Walsh, Michael didn't appear to be sick or injured. Moving slow, yes, but otherwise no red flags stood out. And we actually have a picture of Michael that the officials took um, probably pretty close to his disappearance. And um, you can see in the picture that he he's uninjured. He's got a big smile on his face. Um, nothing about him. That was this one, right? Uh, yeah, that's that picture. Yeah. <clears throat> so that's the last picture that we have of him. And it's, Look at that smile on his face. Yeah. He's, he's right. He just went through all the hardest stuff. And he's smiling. Yeah, he's got a big smile on his face. He's excited. Yeah, you can look at it. You can see the town right in the background. Yep. No signs of any kind of trauma, uh, you know, physical trauma. Um, the weather in that picture looks pretty good. I mean, it, you yeah, can tell it's, it's cloudy. It's gray and cloudy, but, like, it's almost like the rain had just finished gray. Yeah. It's not raining. It's not snowing. Um, yeah, and it's very rare that we have these cases where we have a picture of the person who disappeared, you know, shortly before their disappearance. So, um, I'll zoom in on this one. Okay. This seems to be the same day. Oh, it's in another person's blog. All right, never mind. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> this would be the last time that anyone had will, will have seen uh, Michael. So, it was this official Tom Walsh. 
Uh, when Walsh got to the bottom, he texted race officials that bib number 548, which was Michael's bib number, would be home in about an hour and a half. So now it's July 4th, 2012 at 8 p.m. So by 8 o'clock, um, when he had not appeared, the family notified authorities and almost instantly kind of a hastily prepared search kicked off. Um, and unfortunately, the temperatures were dropping rapidly and rain was increasing. So, um, you know, looking at the picture of Michael, he's in, he has no hat. He's got climbing gloves on, which would not protect you from any kind of moisture uh, and a t-shirt and shorts and running shoes. So definitely not prepared for a cold night in an Alaskan mountain with rain coming down. Um, so like we said, a, a hastily prepared search, uh, you know, kicks gets going. They don't find anything. Um, so by July 5th of 2012 at 2 a.m., an Alaska state, Alaska state trooper helicopter equipped with, equipped with infrared radar sense, uh, sorry, equipped with radar, infrared radar. I can't talk tonight. Yeah. <laughs> Sensitive enough to see footprints left in snow arrived and scanned the mountain. Uh, searchers also That's landed. That's wild. Yeah. That's cool. So, and also searchers uh, landed uh, below and started, you know, using their whistles and things like that. And nothing was, f- and they didn't find anything. So at this point, sleet was falling at race point, and Michael would have been up on the mountain for 12 hours now, only in a T-shirt and shorts. So that is, that's a tough, tough night you're going to have, especially if, he's, if he somehow got up to race point and couldn't get back down into the trees. There's nowhere to take shelter. Yeah, and if you look here, it's the bottom quarter of the race is on the tree line. Yeah, and I mean, once this you is get... Actually cool. You can see this, this is the route. Yeah. Up and down. And once you would get down to the tree line, you're almost a town. Yeah, that's the flattest part. I mean, so, and we'll get into some theories about what people think happened to him. And I've got a, th- I've, you know, got a theory of what may have happened to him as well. Um, so, like we said, uh, it's, it's now the middle of the night. It's sleeting. It's very cold. And he's been up there now in very little gear. Uh, so, searchers feared, even at this early point, that if he was injured, he would already be suffering from hypothermia. So uh, I don't even think that's there's any doubt in that. If he was still alive at this point, he would be very hypothermic. Um, so especially after sweating and losing oh, yeah. all the moisture in his body, and he'd be dehydrated too. Yeah. So um, now it's July fifth, twenty twelve. <clears throat> so when Michael's daughter Marianne didn't hear back from her dad, she flew to Seward on July fifth. Uh, now the larger SAR operation kicked off in earnest uh, in the morning involving firefighters, state troopers, a National Guard helicopter crew armed with infrared tech, mountaineering experts, and search dogs. So they had two helicopters in the area now. The 210th Rescue Squadron of the Alaska Air National Guard, which specializes in searching for downed pilots and missing hikers, arrived with its HH-60 PAV Hawk helicopter for another infrared scan. There are now two helicopters searching for Michael at this point. And as you see on the map, it's safe to assume the search area for Michael is not that big. I mean, it's no. big in the sense it's a large mountainous area, but you pretty much, it's they like know a, what zone to look for. Yeah, I'll go to this one because this showed without snow. You can even see it better. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it, it's almost like a wall. Like they have yeah. to search at a whole wall, so it'll pop up in a second. It's, yeah, look at that. I mean, basically and, that triangle is where you would search. Yeah. Assuming he didn't, so I have some theories. I won't go yeah, don't, into it Yeah, don't yet. go into it yet, but. <laughs> um, yeah, this is like one of those rare instances where they know exactly where he was going. Yep. Uh, he you have, have a picture he, of him. Yeah. And, and like, near the top. So he, he, all he, he was wanted, near the top. And he wanted to finish. Yeah. So you know he's going to try and stay on route. So you have a very good idea of where he would be. Yeah. Um. So. Uh, also on the ground at this time, they had 40 searchers, which soon uh, expanded to 60, uh, and they canvassed the mountain as well. So you had two helicopters with infrared technology in the air. You had 60 searchers canvassing probably the trail area, and they actually, um, from what I read, they actually used, we've heard this in other disappearances where they tie rope to the trees to mark areas that have been searched. Oh, okay. So they were tying, um, you know, like 
like creating hot, a grid, hot colored like that. Um, what do you call it? It's like ribbon. I don't know. I don't know. Oh, like Coban, like the stuff you used to like wrap around, like yeah. to do a tourniquet, kind of, kind of stuff like that. Okay. Um, so that was in the trees. Uh, so why were you saying hot? Like hot pink. Okay. Hot green, hot yellow. <laughs> like, is it is it warm? Is it, I don't know. What you're no, talking no. About. <laughs> the color wise. Okay. You know what I'm talking about now. <laughs> kind of. Kind of. I don't right. know. I don't think you're losing it. Um. Yeah. Maybe I am. <laughs> um. Oh, they call they call it surveyor's tape. Okay. So I'll look it up while you keep going and. So some of the questions people running this search were asking, so they, were, they asked, you know, did Michael hike right past Race Point and continue up uh, the goat path towards the true summit, only to slip down treacherous cliffs, bes- um, you know, beside the path? Did he fall through a melting snow bridge created by the streams that run beneath the lingering snow fields um, and, you know, got injured and was out of sight? Did he beeline straight for Seward through the impossible jungle of uh, uh, Alders and Devil's Club? So they were already kind of asking themselves what they were trying to put themselves into his head. Like, what could he have done for, you know, why can't we find him? Yeah. Um, So SAR members scoured the mountain for days in torrential rains, but found no sign of Michael. Like I said, they even tied strips of pink and orange surveyors taped to branches to mark places they've searched. So Marianne, this was his daughter again, walked the mountain for weeks looking for her dad. She uh, is quoted here. The biggest factor was the record snow. The trail conditions were unlike anything they had seen before, ice underneath. The chutes had snow bridges on them that had been collapsing all summer. My dad had fallen in one of those chutes and a snow bridge had collapsed over him. The infrared helicopters would have not have been able to find him. So that is a good point. Um, yeah. I don't know if you can search what a, a snow bridge looks like, but sure. um, that could be a, a very good theory of as to what happened to him. Um, so I'm going to take a guess without pulling it up yet. It's probably like um, like a natural it seemed like the ground, but really there's nothing underneath it and probably collapsed. So like a, like a little mini valley yeah, that's but, just filled with snow. Yeah, let's see here. These are just the images that pull up. <clears throat> An arc formed by snow across a crevasse. Oh, there you go. So yeah, it's a bridge of just of a snow. Bridge of so there's snow. no structure except it just kind of stuck that way in any type of weight, and it melts it. under it, and then yeah, if someone walks over it, they fall through. There you go. Okay. Yeah. Would you want to cross that? No. Exactly. But you might. But, but if you don't, it. if you don't see it, yeah, that's and probably, probably the locals about. know not to cross these. But if you're a novice that has never hiked this area, but he's or from Alaska, but it's his first race on the mountain. Maybe like you got to know that area. But you know, I mean, he, he he sure he's been in the mountains before, and you would think he would be aware of, um, you know, these. Yeah, conditions. I think that's a good picture of it right there. Yeah, yeah. Would you you might if you're coming straight up and not looking the side, it could just look like it's snow. Yeah. So yeah, I guess okay. you know, That's a. Uh, it's a pretty good theory. Pretty good theory. So the time frame now. This is a rough date because I couldn't find an actual date of when. The search ended, but it's between July 7th and July 8th of uh, 2012. They said four days after Michael disappeared, the state troopers who had spearheaded the search ended uh, the SAR operation. The Seward Seward Volunteer Fire Department kept looking. A cadaver dog arrived from Oregon, and friends continued to pour over high-resolution photographs of the area. Michael's son, John, also came to Seward from Anchorage to uh, comfort Peggy, his wife, during the search. Uh, daughter Marianne, like we said, flew up from Utah and stayed for six weeks climbing the mountains gullies with volunteers. Uh, she even at one point was searching through bear scat to try oh, and geez. find uh, remains or scraps of clothing. So that's uh, sad. Yeah, that's a grisly thing to do. But you know what? I mean, she knows what she's doing because that would be one if he'd been attacked by a bear, which there's tons of bears in Alaska. Yeah. Um, that would be one theoretical way to find his remains, sadly. Mm-hmm. Um, so August of 2012, Michael was declared legally dead after a court proceeding called a presumed death trial. Though Michael was declared dead, he is still considered a missing person by the Alaska State Troopers. After being declared legally dead... Michael's wife, Peggy, sued the race and the Seward Chamber of Commerce for $5 million, alleging negligence and emotional distress. 
Uh, during the court case, chamber officials obtained access to Michael's financial records in an effort to prove that Michael had staged his own disappearance and was in fact alive. They didn't find any proof or sign of life. That is a very odd point to like <laughs> side of the case to go on. Yeah. Um, I mean, he faked his disappearance and he's alive and like they're, they're weighing their whole thing on. He did it for like the money or who knows. Yeah. I mean, I guess I mean, that'd be the only reason I feel like to do it. Like him and his wife are in on it and they're going to declare him dead. They're going to get the money and then go live. I mean, somewhere else, you know, I see, I'm not getting into theories. I'll use that one. <laughs> yeah. I, I highly see, unlikely. I see. I obviously the lawyers for the chamber of commerce have to fight, you know, their case and they're probably, you know, trying every angle to, uh, to win the case. So, yeah. Uh, October, 2014, the Seward chamber of commerce eventually settled with the family for $20,000. Um, the race organize organizers took no responsibility for Michael's disappearance. Um, and, uh, we have a quote here from, uh, someone with the organizers that said race volunteers spoke with Michael as he was approaching the turnaround point and let him know that the race was over. The statement said numerous witnesses, including one medical doctor would have testified at trial that Michael requested no assistance, appear to be no distress and wish to continue to the top of the mountain. So one positive, I guess, uh, if you're an outside observer, the locals, I, I didn't put any, I didn't put any of the quotes from locals about this, but the locals from Seward and people that run this race every year are kind of like, like, eh, yeah, he he was inexperienced. He went up on the mountain and disappeared. Like, Oh, they're like, yeah, that they're can like, happen. They're like, yeah, we, we tell everyone not to do this if they're inexperienced. Like, okay. what do they think is going to happen? That was kind of the the locals' opinion of this. Even though Michael is a local to Alaska, he's not a local to Seward, and he's never run the race before. Sure. And they're even they're like, one guy was like, there's no way to make this race safe. If you want to make it safe, don't do the race. Like, yeah. cancel the event. He's like, there's no, you can't put bumpers on the trail and make everyone wear helmets. And he's like, it's just not going to happen. So um, since this is the one good news, I guess, about this, uh, since Michael's disappearance, new rules uh, were um, put in place, including one that says runners must now sign a pledge saying they've completed the roughly three mile race course at least once prior to race day. Also, participants who don't make the halfway point within one hour are disqualified and race sweepers now follow the last runner on the top of the mountain and all the way back down. Okay. So they have an experienced person. They have guys running the race just to watch dudes running the race? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I mean, it makes sense because he was the last guy up the trail and sure. uh, went missing. So Yeah. Uh, that is the timeline for Michael's disappearance. Now, um, we can get into theories. So I guess, Joe, I'll start with you since – um, you're kind of hearing this for the first time. Okay. So what do you think happened to him? Um, based on what I was seeing on the screen, I think that... We apologize, folks. It's late. Yeah. We're recording no, late I'm tonight. Just, and I'm thinking, too. I use that yawn to think. <laughs> um, I think that he probably fell in a crevasse. Snow, I, the like thing a that, snow bridge collapsed? Uh, I, yeah. I mean, I don't know if it was exactly that. That's That's just what they said, but... Yeah. They made mention of like an odd amount of snow, yeah, on the mountaintop. So a lot of rain that could have melted the snow under it. Yeah, it, it, you can just have a lot of weird stuff happen. And they they talked about it in the video. They said when you get to the top, there's kind of no trail. There's he even said he's like there's multiple places. Don't go this way. Go that yeah. way. If he's by himself, so he's not with like normally. If you're in a group of people who've been doing it and they're all going right, you follow. You him. go right. Yeah. If there's a left, a middle, or a right, and everyone goes right, you go with them. He didn't know which way to go. Yeah, he's by himself. Everyone left him up there. He's like, no, I'm going to finish it. And all he had to do is take the wrong turn. Maybe he went on the dangerous path. Yeah. And there's too much snow, too much water. Maybe all the regulars who normally would have taken that path didn't because they knew. Oh, it's extra snowy. Don't go down the cliff path. Yeah. And slipped or whatever like you're tired you're exhausted you can misstep and things like that i think it was kind of the perfect storm you know first time there really bad conditions by himself yeah i think that's a good theory the hollywood theory is uh <laughs> i didn't think of it because you read it and i was like oh yeah yeah he, him and his wife were trying to scam some insurance company out of money for his disappearance and yeah i mean she settled so that's where i'm like yeah that's not really it you settled for 20 grand 
Like yeah. that's you won't, you don't settle if you're trying to pull the scam because no. you can't disappear for 20 grand. No. It, yeah. So I, the Hollywood theory always is, you know, the fun theory, but yeah, I don't think that's, legit. I don't think that's legit. Um, so I'll go into a couple of statements from kind of officials and people from the area. So, uh, this is a comment from one of the organizers of the race, Carol Fink. Uh, she said in the months before the big day, there had been unusual amounts of snow. We had a little more snow than usual since all the snow hadn't melted out from the Creek. There were some snow bridges that you had to cross that were really creepy a few minutes down, there's Denali uh, Falls. It has a 10-foot drop. Then you then you pop out back out and have to decide whether to take the junior trail, the cliffs, or the waterfall, which is 20 feet out and 70 feet down. Usually by the time of race day, the water hasn't dried up, so you have to know what you're doing because it's very steep and you can fall off. It's a bad idea to come down that way, but people do it. The junior trail is probably the safest uh of the three, but it's dangerous as well. Just cut into the side of the mountain, very steep and narrow trees and roots to negotiate. And it's very slick. I chose to come down the cliffs in a crab walk. It's so steep, uh, hand, hand, foot, foot. So, um, you can, you can imagine too. I mean, that just said it right there. Yeah. To cross rivers with snow bridges that, and she said there's like unavoidable basically. Yeah. And if he was moving that slow, he could have been still up there when the rain started again, and we've hiked in the areas where I remember thinking, like, man, if it was raining right now, I don't know how we would do this. Yeah. Um, yeah, so. some of that rock that you go on is slippery as enough it is dry. Yeah. You, you, you know, slick it up with some water. Yeah. So uh, another official from the area was kind of just, you know, thinking out loud, and he said, it could have been something sudden and drastic happened to Michael, a fall, a broken ankle in the scree, a heart attack. He managed to reach the worst of the brush uh, or else wandered into some of Mount Marathon's frightening unseeable cliffs, dense and difficult areas where searchers might have missed him, shock and hypothermia took hold, and he died there. So that kind of goes into what my theory was. So okay. my theory is multi parted so first of all we know he didn't have water and he was taking it took him hours to get up this trail and um my guess is he probably was starting to get hypo hype uh hypothermic or not dehydrated so even in that picture that we saw of him i'm guessing it, he hasn't had water in three hours. Yeah, so they said people were breaking down before he'd get there, like yeah. to the spaces, so he wasn't getting the normal amount of water. So I I think he's probably dehydrated at this point, and maybe more dehydrated than that even picture shows. So maybe what he did was he got to the top of race point, and he stopped, and he took a breather. You know, like, he's like, I'm already last. Oh, just like took a seat on the rock? Yeah, and just was like, I'm going to wait here for 30 minutes, catch my breath, take in the view. I'm going to be last no matter what. It, it's going to be light out for hours. I mean, at that time of the year in Alaska, it's kind of like perpetual twilight, right? Yeah. I believe. So maybe he, being dehydrated, he gets up there, he's taking his time, and he's becoming more and more dehydrated, and the weather changes like that. And he's he has no protective gear, and... It starts raining, it gets windy, he's already dehydrated, he starts getting hypothermic, and he starts making poor judgment decisions. Yep. Perhaps he, like one of these comments, he hikes the wrong way and keeps going up to the peak. Or, like you said, he went down one of the spots you're not supposed to yeah. and fell into a crevasse or something that searchers Yeah, that lady's statement and the video, the guy's like, you don't want to go down that way. No, so I think I, I think animal ta attack, while it could happen here, from what I read, this is such a populated trail that a lot of the bears and stuff are gonna, not going to be... Well, especially how many people just... A thousand or 999 people just ran through the area. Yeah. There's probably not going to be animals coming back for a bit. And, I mean, I I know bears... You know, I don't, I don't know that bears are going to be in that kind of grade. You know, 60 degrees... Yeah, well, yeah, they don't typically go out of their way to do hard stuff. No, they're going to be down closer to Seward where the food is, you know, by rivers where, you know, salmon are swimming. They're yeah. not going to be up here on the mountain 
so I, I while you can't rule out a, a bear attack, I think that's pretty unlikely. I think yeah. I think it's a combination. He was dehydrated, became hypothermic, made some poor decisions on his way down, got stuck up in there some bad weather, and fell and injured himself. And he had no gear to survive the night. Yeah, I think if you injure yourself and fall, you're not after in that condition at that age. He wasn't going to be lasting long. No, anyway. and this terrain looks just. It's crazy. Yeah, it if looks you pretty fell grueling. somewhere in there, there's a good chance no one's going to find you because yeah, no one's going to go down in there. Yeah, that's and you can see this is that other trail. Yeah, like that's the one that you're not supposed to go down, I guess. Yeah, and that's look at those drops. And I, if he fell in one of those spots, I feel like they would find him. I'm wondering if he fell somewhere, like went off the other side, went, went the off wrong the way. other side, or somewhere down closer to the tree line, or off the other end of the mountain. I. Yeah. I don't know. That's my guess. My guess is he's well, still... Well, if he went off the other side, look at that. That's even steeper than what they're on. Yeah, and it could have been Jeez. covered with snow at the time, too. Yeah, I mean, they said it was all that snowfall. Yeah. So, I mean, this is what it looks like covered in snow. Yeah, so, I mean, he could have fallen off the trail on one of those spots and fallen through an ice bridge as he was falling, yeah. and the searchers never would have found him. And... You know, That's how steep this side is. The other side, yeah. it doesn't have snow on it. <laughs> and you think, too, once the, everything starts melting, all that water is going to you know, move remains out of the area, too. Yeah. Um, now, is that to say they won't eventually find his remains? Uh, who knows? Um, enough people are running this that if, if he fell somewhere That's right. I think it's not on the trail. trail. It's probably yeah. not on the trail. They've run it. Many times since then. Oh, yeah. 2,000 2, yeah. people a year run this trail. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, my guess is he fell somewhere on the opposite side of the trail, and he's over there somewhere. And I think you got to realize it's probably from this point down because they said they found him right here, and he was still headed up. Yeah. So they know he passed all of this stuff just fine. So it really narrows the search down from, like, here to the bottom. Yeah. And, I mean, it could be anywhere along that yeah. trail. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Like, but from the top of it to the bottom, you don't have to worry about this part over here where it goes up. Yeah. So. Yeah, well, I, I I agree with your theory. I think they're <laughs> kind of, I think some just unfortunate accident happened. Yeah. Well, well, thanks everybody for tuning into our show. Please go online and give us your theories. I haven't said that in a while, but there's a lot of people that do share what they think, and we've seen some pretty interesting ideas. So please go do that. Um, we do appreciate you all for listening and sharing locations unknown with your friends and family. Be sure to do that. Also, be sure to like us and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Uh, we have the YouTube channel, which you can subscribe to, and you can pay for the additional content, much like Patreon. Oh, and did I mention we have a Patreon? No, I didn't. <laughs> uh, no, if you want to support us monetarily, you can do that either through the YouTube subscription or through the Patreon account. And if you don't want to sign up for that and get all the amazing extra content that comes along with it, you can go into our Facebook store or our website and buy stuff. We yes. just showed you all that amazing keychains cool and cards swag. and all oh, these. Oh, yeah, we have keychains too. Yeah, I saw that picture pop up there. Yeah. Um, we have all that cool stuff, so you can go there, get the swag. Uh, if you sign up for Patreon, you get the swag with your Patreon account, so that's pretty yes. cool. Uh, and lastly, as always, remember when you're enjoying the beauty of nature, whether backpacking, camping, or simply taking a walk, always remember to leave no trace. Thanks, and we will see you all next time. <laughs>